Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, Lawn Gone author Pam Pennick illustrates how to banish or reduce turf grass for vibrant low water gardens. On tour, see how Meredith Thomas feeds her family with recycling innovation. Daphne explains how to banish weeds and makes her pick of the week. Andrea DeLong Amaya keeps wildflower season going all summer. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. It doesn't cost a fortune to turn a yard into productive food. See how Meredith Thomas feeds her family and soul with recycling innovation. Thank you to Free J. McLeod for sharing his music. Meredith Thomas didn't break the bank when she turned her backyard into organic food for her family, husband Walter Stroop Jr. and sons Walter and Sam. Instead, she honed her scavenging skills to repurpose discards into a sustainable garden. I love being able to go out and pick and eat the food growing in this garden. What's now lush picking ground used to be an overgrown eyesore when the family moved to Austin. Never a gardener before, her odyssey began with her mission to beautify the ugliness with something they could eat. My mother gave me the book The Square Foot Gardener and so that I read that and then I had this quadrant of, of our property that was filled with vines and uh, a totally unuseful space. And I really wanted to do something with this area. Her creative spirit found a new outlet when she built a fence with cedar slabs about to be chunked. That sparked her imagination to put discards back into use. For a long time, I was dumpster diving for cardboard. This entire area was, was blanketed with cardboard. And then I came upon, after I'd built the fence, I had, uh, I'd also scored some pine boards. So I built four four by four beds. She hustled limestone leftovers into her car while out and about. When Central Market took out their cedar deck, she snagged the planks. And so just over time, I think I had something like 14 four by 12 beds approximately. To fill them with productive soil, she relied on other free resources. So I think it's actually revolutionary, a way that we can use waste and turn it into a resource. Uh, so all of my beds have been built by what you would call sheet composting. So the base of the beds, I have cardboard. And then on top of that, I have produce. I would go to a local grocery store and get the produce that they would cull. And then I would um, put that down as a base. And then I couldn't pass by for there was a whole period where I couldn't pass by leaves set out on the street, so that would be another layer. I couldn't pass by Starbucks without picking bags of, of coffee grinds up. That would be another layer, so I just built it up that way. And then if I had some finished compost, I would put four to six inches of that on the top and then plant right away. I did that for the majority of the beds. In one bed, foundling rocks form the base for a water-conserving hugel culture. Essentially, you use logs you pile them into a bed. Often they say they want the beds to actually be like five to six feet tall, these tall beds. And then you just load on to that whatever you have. So I, in one of my beds, I loaded in logs that I had just lying around the property. I did my sheet compost es essentially in there. Ideally, actually, you get some logs that are partially decomposed anyway, that aren't green, that those logs act as sponges and hold the water. She added a keyhole garden concept, a central compost funnel that nourishes the soil with kitchen and garden wastes. To support vining plants, she keeps an eye out for worthy candidates. Once one opens one's eyes to what's around us, there's, there's so much, you can practically pick any category, food, materials, there's so much that is still of good, could be of good use that's wasted. The main thing she bought was pea gravel. I wanted to have some, some elegance, some grace, even though this is completely rustic. 
it's whatever I can build with my two hands, which is not, I can't, I just don't have the skills or maybe even the um, desire to make everything perfect. But I did want some, at least some lines that were clean. I have, I have the pea gravel instead of lawn because I, I uh, didn't want to be watering lawn. Now I'm philosophically against lawn. Uh, I also wanted something that my feet would be clean in when I would come out here. Um, I like the, I actually kind of have a fondness for pea gravel. I like the look. <laughs> I thought about just straight up mulch, but I decided to go with the rock. Scavenges came in handy to fend off underground weeds. I've used landscape barrier and cardboard. Cardboard outperforms. I've, and I've used uh, coffee sacks. That was another project I did. Coffee sacks I found were like the perfect medium. Her only regret was that she left only two feet in one path, making it difficult to navigate when summer's okra is in full force. Otherwise, she's made it easy to pick and choose ingredients for any meal. In summer, she fills the family's bowls with six different kinds of basil. Summer is also prime time for okra. It loves heat. It'll take the drought, um, you know, bring on the 100 degree plus days. I don't have the typical Southern experience. And so I actually started eating it just raw, just in a salad chopped up with olive oil and balsamic vinegar, a little salt and pepper, delicious. And I've eaten the leaves. The leaves are edible as well, fresh, or also sauteed like you would do Swiss chard or any of the greens. Now I haven't had okra oil yet. In many parts of the world, they press the seeds to make oil. And also, okra <laughs> is considered an amazing source for biofuel. The ultimate recycling, gathering seeds at the end of the season for next year's crops. It's very easy to do, very easy. So again, it doesn't have to be something that one buys in a package in a store. Nature, they, they provided that for us. <laughs> In the off season, she keeps the goodness going by canning, pickling, and fermenting. She conserves water and improves the beds with a constant layer of mulch, whatever she can get for free. She doesn't buy fertilizer either. I have drug back bags of, of seaweed from the coast when we go there, much to my children's consternation because it doesn't smell so great. <laughs> I try not at all to, to buy anything. For instance, when I was planting tomatoes, I took uh, Quality Seafood, gave me a bunch of fish heads, and I, I planted those in the base. Um, but in a general basis, I don't have a compost pile anymore, except in the chicken area. Uh, when I have any sorts of trimmings from the kitchen or from garden debris, I just pull apart the, just move the mulch and tuck it under. So there's just a constant feeding. Her front yard chicken coop adds fresh eggs to their menu, along with fertilizer for the garden. So plants love animal matter, and animals love plant matter. It all goes together. I have a compost pile in the chicken coop, so that will in turn then feed the vegetables that I have. To feed the artful soul, she doesn't head for the store. When an artist friend rejected some of her paintings, Meredith rescued them. Husband Walter celebrated Meredith with his handmade prayer flags that depict important elements of her life. They won't last forever in Texas weather. Meredith values their symbolic impermanence, just like her paintings that will fade in time, the ephemeral that engages us just for the moment and leaves its mark on our lives. That's the cycle of things. And because now I have this little seed that then grows into to these enormous stalks, of okra and then eventually die, you can't help but be really intimately connected with what life is all about. It's very easy to become philosophical once you're a food gardener. Thanks so much for sharing your garden with us. And now we're gonna be talking about lawn gone. That's right, uh, getting rid of lawns or at least reducing their space and scale in our gardens. And Pam Pennick, our friend here from Austin, Texas, is joining us for this conversation. She has written a book called Lawn Gone mm -hmm. and uh, filled with good ideas about alternatives to lawn spaces. So welcome to Central Texas Gardener. Thanks, Tom. I'm glad to be back. Yeah, it's always a, a pleasure to visit with you. And tell me about why you got inspired to write this book. 
Well, as you know, I do garden design here in Austin, and it seems like all of my clients these days, the first request is they want to get rid of their lawn. The drought's taking a toll. They don't want to keep up with the watering. So, you know, the first question is, what can we do instead? We're going to rip it out. What can we do? And so I set out to just write, explain to people, mostly do-it-yourselfers, mm -hmm. how they can do it, what, what the options are, let people kind of be inspired by the pictures and the different options for plants and hardscape and then try to give them the nitty gritty on how to get it done. All right. Well, there's lots of inspiration in the book in the form of beautiful images and, uh, and again, very practical too, I think, mm -hmm. in terms of here are, some, here are the ideas and, and get to it, basically. Right, you right. Know. I was trying to really give people the how-to so they could just get out there and, and do it. People who don't necessarily know how to garden already, people who are beginners, um, give them the information they need. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's take them through some of the steps, the baby steps of, of getting this job done. You know, what are mm -hmm. the first things that people really need to think about? Well, they need to think about how they want to use the space. Do, yeah. they, do they want to look out their window and have a pretty view? Do they want to be out there playing with their dog? Do they need space for the kids to play? Do they want to be out there entertaining in the evening? Maybe a fire pit, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so you really want to just think through and let your mind just kind of be open to the possibilities of what your yard can be as opposed to just the lawn desert, you know, just a big <laughs> exactly. space of lawn that's really not very inviting. Yeah. Um, so once you start thinking about those things and you narrow it down to um, what will fit in the space, and you can, I always tell people just to get a copy of their survey out and just start sketching ideas on the mm -hmm. survey and you can use um, transparent paper over that, just sketch out various ideas right. and then try to narrow it down from there. That's what all professionals do, really, That's what right? we do, too. That's right. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, you're just trying to get the ideas flowing right. and be open to things and then and then really narrow it down to the things that you want the most. Right. Well, th thinking about the things you want most, you know, and, and people often forget to put entertaining or, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, the, uh, conversation areas and all those kinds of things. They right. don't associate it with, with the outdoors. To them, that's all indoor space. Mm -hmm. But you can create those rooms outside mm -hmm. uh, using some of the, the tips that you've recommended here, and and you've that's illustrated right. as well. Yeah, it's really important to think about those people spaces. Um, mm -hmm. When you just think about replacing it with plants, well, you can end up with the same kind of result as a lawn. You'll, you mm -hmm. know, if that's if that's if you're looking for something just something to cover the lawn, that's you can do a ground cover that may do the same thing. But sure. really, if you want to get more out of your space, why not think of ways to um, you know, invite yourself into the space or invite mm -hmm. your friends and have some places to walk to a destination, patio or something like that. Sure. And, mm -hmm. and you're not advocating completely eradicating all grass or grass-like plant I'm materials. not a lawn hater. <laughs> 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 I always tell people, I mean, sometimes a lawn is the best use of a space when mm -hmm. you need a space for your kids to play. If you like yeah. to go out there and throw the ball to your dog, right. a lawn is a great, is mm -hmm. a great ground cover for that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be your whole yard, though. It exactly. could be that you could pare it down to a very usable space mm -hmm. in the center maybe or off to one side and then you could fill the other parts of your yard with um, you know, a patio space or some great plants and there's right. just a lot of different options. Well, let's take soft spaces and then and hard spaces mm -hmm. and kind of divide them out and, and, and in the soft spaces you recommend some plants and strategies for lawn alternatives as well, right? Right. Yeah, there's, you know, there's a world of plants out there and, and um, um, it just really, you really need to do a little research on your region mm -hmm. first to find out, you know, before you just go to the nursery and start picking out plants willy-nilly, make sure that the plants are suited to your mm -hmm. hot and cold temperatures. And a lot of times, you know, in this part of the country, you find that um, you might be in the range for the, for the cold temperatures, but you've got to really get a handle on whether your plants can take the heat. And yeah. there's a lot of good resources for people to find those things out. You go to your local independent nursery and talk to them and find out which plants perform the best read your local garden blogs, see what people are growing, see what's successful, mm. and that'll give you a that'll give you a good start right. for the plants. And then, you know, in the book I talked about all the different kind of plants. There's low-growing grassy plants, there's low-growing perennials, there's small shrubs. Um, mm -hmm. There's alternative lawns that are made up of a bunch of different kinds of native grasses. Right, sedges so and things sedges, like that. Sedges, yeah. So right. there's just all kinds of of great plant alternatives to explore. All right, sticking with that idea of softer spaces, mm -hmm. uh, the utilization of things just in, instead of, of grass, uh, you could also go with things just like mulch areas. For example, 
Uh, you have a lovely image of a hammock area in one garden. Where, That's right. And obviously underneath of that, mulch would perform ex exactly what you want it to do. Yeah, so especially if you have a lot of trees. If you have a very wooded lot, mm -hmm. mulch can be a great substitute. You know, the grass tends to grow thin under trees. It doesn't get enough light and it looks patchy. And I'll often have people call me up and say, what can we do to replace this grass? It just won't grow under the trees. I'm like, well, don't, don't try to grow the grass where it doesn't want to grow. I mean, that's a great way to just really start... Um, looking at areas where you can reduce your grass. Put in dry, loving ground covers under there. It could be like inland sea oats, it could sure. be sedges, you know, things like that that want to grow into there. Or open up the space for a, for a mulch patio under exactly. the trees. Right. That could be lovely. A nice wooden kind of look. Mm -hmm. So all sorts of, of alternatives there. Now on the hardscape side of things, I always think of sitting areas and transit areas, basically, for hardscape. Right. It's like you're, you're moving patios. through the garden mm -hmm. or put, that are destinations in the garden to be. Right. You know. People places. Exactly. Yeah. And you need, you need to have, you know, if you're looking at ways to reduce your grass and things you don't want to water, and you can look at those patio spaces, you're never going to have to mow them. You're never going to have to water them. Exactly, right. <laughs> so it's a great way to think about reducing the lawn. And then it also has the benefit of inviting you out into it. So where yeah. you find that you're, um, you know, tracking through the mud to get to the shed or to take the garbage cans out, you know, make that a nice gravel path or mm -hmm. um, put in a patio in a shady spot so you can go out and enjoy the garden mm -hmm. and then surround it with the plants that you love. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you have what I love about what I've seen in the book um, lots of specific uh, suggestions for making those places interesting too. Mm -hmm. It's not just, you know, uh, you know, a gravel gravel path, but or you know, you have all, uh, different strategies for really providing great interest in texture and layering in you those do. kinds of spaces. Yeah, that's really where you can personalize your garden. There's an example of a path with different m materials made up in it, like a patchwork path is what I call mm -hmm. it. I mean, that's easy to do. You just kind of accumulate things over time and maybe you got a collection of old tiles in one part of your yard and some old stone. You know, why not mix it up? And um, you can be very creative in what you do and that adds personality mm -hmm. to your garden. And so I do want to try to provide um, images like that to inspire people to... Think outside and, the box. And water features, too, mm -hmm, you know, right. which can be the focal points of those hardscape areas. Yeah, and it's funny because um, most people might not think about a water feature as something you want to put in when you're trying to reduce your water usage. Um, you know, it's full of water. But um, right. actually, it can be, you can use as little, you know, uh, less water than you would use to water your lawn if you have a simple water feature. If it doesn't have a big splashy fountain, because then you can lose water to evaporation, but have right. a small bubbler, you know, or have it be a still feature. Mm -hmm. Um, have it sited in some shade, and then you can um, reduce your water um, loss and still enjoy this beautiful uh, small pond. And I tell mm -hmm. people to kind of go with a geometric shape if you want to make it simple. Don't try right. to replicate nature because that's actually really hard right. uh, to that, make it look good. Right. That's, uh, I tell people that all the time. Yeah, but you go with a man-made shape. Um, mm -hmm. It could be like a, a, a cattle trough. Right. Stock tank pond. And I think those, they look awesome. They look great. And they're it's raised and they're up, really, easy to maintain. Make it easy. They do. Right. There's no digging. <laughs> right, right. So that's a, a great solution. And uh, but you could also do one in ground that's circular, mm -hmm. and uh, and put a nice wide patio around it, and then you've got um, a, a beautiful space to enjoy. Maybe you have some fish. Maybe have some water lilies. Right. And real along. briefly, I know that the book also contains lots of good in plant information. Mm -hmm. And it's not trying to be comprehensive, though. No, um, and I do want to provide, um, you know, there's the kind of conceptual ideas in the front, different kinds of plants you might think to try. Uh, in the back of the book, there are 11 regions represented mm -hmm. with um, regional experts, gardening experts from each of those regions picking plants that mm -hmm. would do well in their area so that it, it's it's good for people no matter where they live. Well, I, I commend you on mm -hmm. doing this because it's important that we all be thinking about this. And uh, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. To do, it's, and it's, and it's, it's fun to convert the gardens mm -hmm. uh, using these ideas as well. It is. You know, you can, make a, you can make it pretty simple, and then if you want to, you can mix it up with different kinds of plants, and you might find yourself addicted to it. <laughs> I'm, sure that, I'm sure that some of your readers will find it addictive. Yeah. Pam, it's a pleasure to see you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be okay. here. Well, welcome back to the program, and uh, it's now time for our friend Daphne. Daphne Richards and this is Augie. Our question this week is from viewer Diane Salazar who recently moved into a new house and needs some advice on sprucing up the neglected landscape. Diane says that the home was vacant over a year and a half before they purchased it so the yard's really out of shape. Well Diane, the best place to start would be your soil. If the landscape has not been irrigated since the house was vacated so long ago, the soil is going to be very compacted. 
so you should plan to rent the proper equipment or hire someone to aerate, then put the landscape back on a regular irrigation schedule. Even watering just once a month, if we aren't getting any rain, will go a long ways towards keeping your soil from drying out completely and shrinking in on itself. Compacted soil is like rock to a plant's roots, so growth is really inhibited. But aeration will create nice little holes where irrigation water and oxygen can move into the soil more easily, helping to soften it up. As for the weeds, keep pulling them, as you say you've already started doing, and use mulch around any established trees and shrubs or any plants that you intend to keep. Diane also wanted to know about putting down newspaper under the mulch, and yes, that's a great idea. Mulching alone does help to inhibit weed growth, but really only works if the weed seeds haven't yet germinated. Once the seedling emerges, the plant usually has plenty of stored carbohydrates to push up through your mulch, reach the sun, and grow by leaps and bounds overnight. A layer of newspaper, one section or six to 10 pages thick, will usually do the trick. The newspaper barrier is a little harder for weeds to push through, although not impossible. Be sure to moisten the newspaper before you put the mulch on top of it. If we get lucky and have a hard rain soon, your mulch will wash right off the dry newspaper in a little avalanche. Our plant this week is tatumi squash, Cucurbita pipo tatumi. This prolific producer is a must have for any vegetable gardener, especially if you're converting some lawn space and growing vegetables for the first time. It's easy to grow and will likely produce more fruit than you can possibly eat. Viewer Caroline Homer sent us these photos from her garden where she says, and I quote, I plant tatumi the first or second week of March and the stuff's coming out of my ears by mid-May. Tatumi prefers to sprawl on the ground rather than to be trellis, so give it plenty of space, six to eight feet on all sides. If you've ever grown squash, you've come face to face with the dreaded squash vine borer, which destroys squash plants in the blink of an eye. Although it's not immune to these insects, Tatumi does tolerate the damage better than any other squash choice for Central Texas gardens. Tatumi also thrives in full sun, requiring very little supplemental irrigation. Twice a week, deep watering is usually sufficient to keep Tatumi growing and blooming and fruiting through early summer. If you find that you're getting more squash than you can handle, simply harvest some of the blooms to use in salads. Many vegetables benefit from fertilization throughout production season, but tatumi will perform just fine if only fertilized lightly at the time of planting. Tatumi squash is an heirloom variety, so you may have to shop around to find seeds. I want to let you know about a great upcoming tree care program on April 13th. Check out our website, travis-texas.tamu.edu for more information. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit klru.org slash ctg to send us your questions or plants of the week from your garden. Thanks, Stephanie. Now let's check in with Andrea DeLong Amaya for Backyard Basics. So every year, this time of year, we drive down the highway and you look at beautiful fields just covered with blue bonnets and other wildflowers, and you might think, oh, what can I do to get those in my garden? Well, this time of year is really too late to get your seeds going because you really need to plant them in the summer or fall of the previous year for good flowers. But the good news is there are a lot of things that you can do right now, summer annuals that will bloom either in the, in the summer or later in the fall. So you can do things like partridge pea is one of my favorites. Um, it's a great plant. It's a in the bean family or legume family and it gets about two and a half to three feet tall. And it's really nice because it's very fast. You can put seed down and they'll be blooming. I've had them bloom, you know, four or five weeks uh, after planting them, so they're very fast. And they're also very airy, which means you can throw them over something like wine cups, which bloom nicely in the spring, but then come summertime, they're looking a little faded. So partridge pea can grow over them and they don't really shade out the wine cups underneath. So that's a really nice pairing. They're also really good for being a nectar plant for butterflies, and they're also a good larval food plant for, uh, particularly for sulfur butterflies. Another one of my favorites is a Ringo, and it looks like a nice little purple pineapple. Uh, a lot of people might describe it as looking like a thistle, and it's very unusual to think about it, but it's actually in the parsley family. Um, these are also uh, annuals that grow, you plant them now, they grow throughout the summer, they bolt and bloom in the late summer and early fall, and they're really beautiful. They're great for using in dried flower arrangements or in fresh flower arrangements, and also a really good nectar source for some of your uh, swallowtail butterflies in particular. 
Indian blanket is another one that is really easy to grow and very fast. Um, usually they're blooming in early spring, but if you plant them later in the spring, you'll actually extend their bloom period so you can get them to bloom throughout the summer. Another trick with them is to deadhead them to keep them blooming. Again, another really good plant for attracting butterflies. Um, and also some of the seed-eating birds, like goldfinches, will eat the seeds out of them, which is also a good thing if you're trying to attract songbirds. If you have a shady garden and you're looking for some kind of uh, summer blooming plant that you can plant from seed now, um, the tropical sage is a really good option. Uh, also called scarlet sage, you can buy the seed. Um, they're very easy to grow, really good for attracting hummingbirds and butterflies, particularly the larger butterflies. And they will reseed for you very nicely. Um, if they get a little leggy, they're very easy to, to uh, just trim them back and that keeps them nice and compact and bushy. So that's another really good one, especially for shady conditions. Um, if you have a large space, the annual sunflowers are really good. They're very cheerful. You plant them in the spring. They bloom very quickly. You'll see them blooming pretty much all summer and into the fall. Um, another really good plant to provide seed for goldfinches and other seed-eating birds. Also good for bees and butterflies and other uh, kinds of pollinators. So there's a lot of things that you can plant right now that you can give you nice color and lots of activity in your garden throughout the summer and into the fall. So for Backyard Basics, I'm Andrea DeLongamaya. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and be sure to like us on Facebook. Next week, check out edible tropicals like avocados. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.